Good morning, everybody. Again, I'm Jen Pollack. Welcome um, to Are You Prepared for a New Level of Clean in Your Facilities? Uh, we're going to be going through a lot of great information today. Uh, Andrew Harris, who is one of our um, sales consultants uh, from our Lansing Jackson branch, will be taking us through the material today. And then we also do have uh, Paul Ranville from Clorox, who is with us, as well as Jeff Kramer from Hilliard, um, both uh, great partners of KSS uh, and really good resources resources uh, for being able to um, answer questions at the end and be able to help as we go. So again, if you have questions as we're going through the presentation today, uh, please use the chat feature, ask me some questions, and then when we're done, um, I'll be kind of moderating those with Andrew and Paul and Jeff to be able to answer those. So we will go ahead and get started. So Andrew, I will let you take it away. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us. So um, we'll get right going so we can appreciate their, uh, uh, so we can be, uh, 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 you know, paying attention to your time. So are you prepared for a new level of clean? So first I want to show you guys this slide. And this is just uh, to kind of show you the scope of KSS Enterprises. Uh, I know we've got people from all over the state with us today, possibly some from Indiana as well. So it just kind of gives you the area that we cover and uh, how we can help you guys out wherever you're at. So. And a uh, you know, great point of note is that we are celebrating 75 years of business this year. So uh, a great year to have uh, anniversary, that's for sure. So, <laughs> but let's jump right in. So what are coronaviruses and how many are there? I know we've, we've been hearing a lot over the last couple of months now about what coronaviruses are. And I think this is important to understand that we've been through coronaviruses before. Uh, in fact, before this, there were six others. Uh, this is now the seventh that's been known to transmit from animals to humans. Um, we had uh, back in 20 or 2003, we had SARS, and in 2012, we had uh, MERS. Those were both coronaviruses, and they both had uh, fatalities and, you know, infectious. Uh, it was very infectious, so, but it, obviously nothing to what we've seen today, but I think it's important to know that We've been here before, we've seen viruses, we'll figure it out and we'll get through it and there'll be another one someday. So COVID-19 is a new disease and we're still learning about it. Um, we're learning how it spreads, the severity of the illness it causes, to what extent it may spread in the United States and it's still changing. I just read an article last night about how the CDC was talking about how it lived on surfaces and things and trying to understand that better. So. Um, you know, there's always new information coming out. So what can we do and what are we doing right now? Well, we've flattened the curve through social distancing. Uh, we are finding creative ways of meeting and conducting business. We've stayed safe at home and we're now looking at ways of opening things up wisely and safely. I think that's the most important thing right now to think about is that we have to get back to living once again and uh, we have to do it in a different way. Kind of think about it like uh, pre and post 9-11, you know, before 9-11 or after 9-11, security measures spiked and it kept up the drastic protocols for a couple of years after that. It resulted in the TSA and Homeland Security. Now things have evolved and measures are still in place that are heightened beyond what they were pre 9-11. When we think about disinfection uh, pre-COVID-19, we disinfected enough we maybe let the surfaces stay wet long enough and maybe we wore our PPE and we washed our hands. Now we'll have a heightened sense of disinfection. We need to adapt and improve our daily protocols. Bottom line, things are going to be different now. So I identified uh, five needs for success that we're gonna go over. And the first one uh, we've heard over and over again for eight to 10 weeks, uh, for proper hand hygiene, you know, do we have a proper hand hygiene program? Do we understand how soap, sanitizer, behavior modification tools, and hand drying all make a difference? Proper chemicals, tools, and equipment. Know what to use and why it works. Adjust for cleaning frequencies to soil loads and threat levels. Adjust, so, uh, adjust as soil loads and required appearance dictates. Additionally, adjust anything as threat levels change. Proper training and procedures, know how to use disinfectants and tools and follow comprehensive programs for entire facility coverage. Verification, validation, and documentation. We you use equipment to know what bacteria removal has been accomplished. 
and then we have inspection forms and then you have your follow-up conversations so proper hand hygiene programs um, proper hand hygiene is the best defense against spreading disease it removes germs helps you avoid getting sick and prevents the spread of germs to others having a complete hand hygiene program is an essential part of health and safety in your facility so you have to ask yourself what is your current hand hygiene program do you have sanitary soap dispensers is there hand washing education uh, hand sanitizer in strategic locations behavior modification tools and signage healthy hand drying when we talk about sanitary soap dispensers we think about bulk fill systems versus closed fill uh, closed systems so the closed systems are here on the on the left side of the screen you want to have something that's a bagged system where the soap comes closed up and it has a fresh pump every time you put a bag in. There are a lot of bulk fill systems out there that look like closed systems like this, but they aren't. And they'll end up looking like this on the bottom of the pump. And if you don't change that pump out or if you don't take that out and wash it off, it'll continue to look like that and it'll build up bacteria and things like that in that uh, soap scum that's there. Also, the you know clear bulk fill systems like this you can see the soap separation you can see where people have just topped off and put more soap in the container the manufacturers of these dispensers actually tell you the proper way to refill these is to dump any remaining product out wash them out let them dry put them back up and then fill them back up people like bulk fill systems because they're perceived as cheap but if you pay attention to a study that was done uh, by Dr. Gerba, I'm going to read this to you. It says, every time you use soap from open refillable bulk soap reservoir dispensers, you could be putting hundreds of millions of fecal bacteria on your hands, which is actually more than is in the toilet after you flush it. Uh, Dr. Gerba is a microbiologist from the University of Arizona in Tucson. The studies conducted by the university under his direction showed that approximately 23 to 25 percent of samples taken from open refillable bulk soap reservoir dispensers were contaminated with unsafe levels of bacteria. Coliforms, illness-causing fecal-based organisms, were found in 16 to 22 percent of the samples. So this isn't only important for COVID-19 or coronavirus, this is important for lots of other pathogens that pass through our facilities to remember that we want to have people washing their hands with something that's safe for them and it isn't going to be causing any greater illness. So when you, again, you think about that perception that bulk soap is cheap, when you have people missing work, when you have students not coming to school, um, when you have a mass breakout of a disease in your facility, that is not cheap. So you can head that off with having a little bit better hand hygiene program in your facility. You know, you also need to have the right tools in place to help people realize this is where I can wash my hands or did I wash my hands or, oh, here's a hand sanitizer station. We have behavior modification tools, which is signage. You should have these up uh, near your uh, dispensers in your restrooms. You should have them near your sa hand sanitizer dispenser stations. Um, and then if you have employees that are working in areas that are going to be interacting with people, you want to have those must wash hands before returning to work signs up. Um, we've seen a lot of other uh, modification tools or behavior modification tools come out lately as well with uh, tape on the floor or uh, we have mats now that you know indicate where the hand washing or hand, hand washing and hand sanitizing stations are. There's a lot of different ways we can cue people to wash their hands now. And when we think about hand hygiene, we have to also think about how we dry our hands. Um, I remember back in the fall before all this started, there were a lot of articles starting to circulate about hand dryers versus hand towel. And when you looked at some of the videos that were coming out and showing the bacteria that were still left on your hands after using a dryer or actually how they increased, um, it was staggering. So uh, in a study that uh, compared drying efficiency and bacterial contamination from electric dryers against that of hand towels, the number of bacteria was reduced by 77% when the participants used a paper towel. The participants uh, that used the warm air dryers the bacteria on their hand increased by 254%. And when we think about trying to safely reopen and we think about the hand drying that we have in our facilities, uh, social distancing in a restroom, once you kick that hand dryer on, doesn't mean anything. 
And I'm not saying you have to go out and automatically rip down all your hand dryers, no, but you might want to give people an option in your restrooms to use a hand towel versus a hand dryer uh, because they're going to, they're probably going to want to gravitate toward the hand towel because not only does it dry their hands, but it also gives them something to turn the faucet off with and pull the handle open on the door and keep their hands clean after that. So healthy hand drying goes part and parcel with the whole washing of the hands. Knowing the difference between cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitizing. Guys, again, I think this is going to be something that's going to be huge. And it's part of something you're going to be able to communicate to the people in your facilities, to the administrators above you, to help them know that you know what you're doing. And this may be stuff that you already know, but it's never bad to hear it again and to refresh what we do on a daily basis. So the differences between these three things, cleaning removes germs, dirt, and impurities from surfaces or objects. Cleaning works by using soap or detergent and water to physically remove germs from surfaces. This process does not necessarily kill germs, but, removing, but by removing them, it lowers their numbers and the risk of spreading infection. Sanitizing lowers the numbers of germs on surfaces or objects to an acceptable level as judged by the public health standards or requirements. This process works on objects to lower the risk of spreading infection. Disinfecting kills germs on surfaces or objects. Disinfecting works by using chemicals to kill germs on surfaces or objects you are trying to achieve. Uh, or, uh, or surface, uh, use an EPA registered disinfectant with efficacy for the results you are trying to achieve and what the necessary dwell times are to be effective to achieve those results. So this is, uh, again, very important because a lot of people think when they're disinfecting that they're cleaning at the same time. Now there are cleaner disinfectants and we're going to dig a little deeper into this, but I, I want to stop here just for a minute to help that sink in. Cleaning doesn't disinfect and disinfect doesn't clean. Both of them together get us to where we want to go. So these next couple of slides, uh, I'm just kind of showing you not as a product dump or a pitch or anything, but just to show you the depth of field that we have when it comes to disinfectants that are on the EPA and CDC approved lists for the emerging pathogen protocols. So we have a lot of products from our partner at Hilliard that are on that list to help fight this. Um, another point, important thing to remember is that there is no disinfectant as of yet that has a COVID-19 kill claim. We're using the CDC emerging pathogen protocol uh, to help fight diseases that are similar to, and these have been shown effective against those. So um, don't let anybody fool you. I've seen some documentation out circulating that talks about using EPA or CDC approved disinfectant to kill COVID-19. There isn't anything yet. This is our list from Buckeye. Uh, so again, a, a long list of products. So if we get into a pinch again, we know that we have backups. And then our partners at Clorox, a lot of great products from them as well. So in disinfection, the and cleaning and disinfecting, the whole point is to break the chain of infection. And if you've never seen what the chain of infection looks like, here's just a, a fun graphic to help you understand that at some point in your day, while you're going about doing your tasks, you are breaking this cycle somewhere along the way. This chain, what you're doing is taking that out and either removing the germs or keeping people safe. So how the germs get around, that's the mode of transmission. Germs travel on uh, handles, they travel on doorknobs, they travel on computer keyboards and telephone handles, all or telephones, all kinds of places how they get around. They get out through our droplets uh, when we speak or sneeze. And how germs get in, that's the portal of entry the mouth, the cuts, the skin, the eyes. So, you know, we can break the chain of infection there simply by wearing our PPE sometimes and washing our hands. The next sick person is the, is the susceptible host. These are babies, children, elderly people, uh, people with weakened immune systems. Uh, basically anybody that's out there can get sick. Uh, not just from COVID-19, from anything. So germs, the agent, these are the bacteria, the viruses, the pathogens, the parasites, all those fun things. And that's what we're gonna be after when we're sanitizing and disinfecting and cleaning. You know, we're doing all of that together to get rid of these guys. Where germs live, the reservoir, they live in us. They live in our pets, our, the wild animals. They live in food, soil, water, they're everywhere. 
So, and how germs get out, again, through droplets, through our mouth, uh, through our nose, through cuts in our skin with blood, uh, during diapering and, and toileting. So if you work in an assisted living facility or a daycare, you have to worry about those types of issues. Pre and post COVID-19, adjust cleaning frequencies to soil loads and threat levels. There are four different threat levels and uh, when we think about threat level one, no contagious disease threats, cleaning evaluated on sight and smell, routine quality cleaning. If it looks clean and it smells clean, it is clean, right? We've lived under that principle for a long time, I think, that you know, everybody has that one person in their facility that comes up to them in the morning or the afternoon or whenever you meet them, and they say, boy, whoever cleaned my office or my room or classroom or whatever it is, and it smelled so lemony fresh, because at the end of the custodian's job in there, they spritzed a little, you know, air freshener or uh, lemon disinfectant spray in the air, because they know if they don't, the person that's in that room won't think that they cleaned it. But everybody's kind of, somebody's got to be laughing right now because they know exactly who I'm talking about in their facility. Again, I think we've lived here for a long time because we've, we've gotten comfortable. There have been other extenuating circumstances that have also caused us to have to be in this kind of a state of mind. Whether we have the people, we have the payroll, we have the tools, the equipment, whatever it may be to work effectively, we've had to almost settle to a point to a look clean, smells clean, it is clean mentality. And that has to change. If that's your facility, that probably needs to change immediately. So then we get to threat level two. This is highly contagious pathogens in the community. Sanitary cleaning procedures are ramped up. I don't want us to think about this as COVID-19 just yet. I want us to think about in our normal lives before this, this was when the flu started coming up, norovirus started coming up. You know, in the the early fall, we started thinking about, I better get some more disinfectant, some hand sanitizer. Um, and then we carried that through till February, March, you know, when things started, you know, calming down a little bit. So, you know, this is what we used to do and it's not bad. I want to, I don't want to say that, but when we get to threat level two, we start asking ourselves these questions. Do we know the efficacy and applications of our products? Are they EPA approved for the current threat and how are we using them? Do we know the proper dwell time needed to kill the viruses that we're facing right now? Are we using ready to use versus dilutable or dilution controlled products? These are all great questions to ask when we get into these times where we're starting to deal with sicknesses that are spreading around. So in threat level two, we're also going to increase frequencies of all critical touch points, doorknobs, handles, light fixtures, computer keyboards, desktops, handrails, water fountains, all points, all touch points associated with bacteria transfers, clean and disinfect them multiple times a day. And now here's another piece about this, is I don't think the, any facility is going to be able to go forward relying solely on the cleaning crew to take care of all of these touch points multiple times a day. It's impossible at the, the crew levels that we have for everybody to hit a doorknob every couple of hours because you, you just, I don't think there's any physical way you could do it. So there are other people in your facilities that may have to step up. This is where when wipes come available, you might have more wipes laying around for people to be able to grab and, and wipe down certain touch points. It's gonna be a little bit of a team mentality, I think, going out of this. Ultimately, sole responsibility will be on us as cleaning people um, and then sanitizing soft surfaces. Uh, we need to make sure that we understand people are gonna ask you probably to disinfect their chairs or their, the, whatever is in the waiting rooms or any couches or soft surfaces that might be around. You have to help them understand that there is no protocol for disinfecting soft surfaces, but sanitizing soft surfaces should increase a little bit too. And we've got great products to help you out with that. But just by going through and doing those, uh, things on the soft surfaces are going to help lower the pathogens on there. And then of course, if you've got a great, you know, uh, upholstery extractor, that's going to be a way to really reduce any pathogens on soft surfaces. Um, also, I want to talk about a little bit of uh, misinformation that's going on right now around disinfectants. And this kind of goes back to, uh, do we know the uh, uh, protocols and the application methods for the products that we're using? Labels are more important now than ever. 
because on the labels for your disinfectants, it tells you the application method that they're approved for, the dwell times that they are uh, to have for the kill claims that they have, and what they kill in those times. The, uh, if it doesn't say it, you can't claim it uh, analogy or uh, uh, saying is more important now than ever because there's a lot of different tools out there and we're going to get into tools here shortly, but there's a lot of different tools out there that are being touted as the greatest thing to help get disinfecting done. Um, but if the label doesn't say it, you can't claim it. Remember that. Pro Proper personal protection, so PPE. I'm sure everybody on this call has ordered extra masks, gloves, uh, safety glasses, face shields, uh, all kinds of things, uh, more than you have in the past. And I don't think that's gonna go away. Um, in fact, it probably shouldn't have gone away to begin with, but we get comfortable. But going forward, we need to make sure our staff understands how important it is to wear the appropriate PPE, the procedures your staff should always be doing, it is your job to train them and make sure your policies are implemented and PPE is available. Tools for disinfection. So uh, great visual, again, things you may already know, but great visual reminders to help you know what tools you have in place already or may need to upgrade. So microfiber rags, great tool. Uh, spray bottles, the tried and true, everybody's got them. Pump up sprayers, again, most probably everybody has those as well. You've got dilutable disinfectants and Clorox wipes. Um, right here is, a, is an electrostatic sprayer for disinfection. This is the Clorox T360. And this is, I'm gonna stop here for a minute, not as a pitch, but just a uh, help to clarify. Again, there's a lot of different tools that are out there that are being said to be you know, just as good or they are effective. There are different levels of tools. Uh, and it, I want you to think about this way. You can go out and buy a DeWalt drill or a hammer. Both work. One works better than the other, okay? So just remember that. Uh, then you have your dilution control systems. Those are just a couple that we offer. And then uh, touchless restroom cleaners. Again, this is, this is our Hilliard product, but uh, there are a lot of different touchless restroom cleaners out there. Guys, this is going to be something I think people will want going forward, especially when you think about disinfection in restrooms. And if it, you think, ask yourself this question, if you had to have your head next to the toilet to clean the toilet, would you prefer to be able to stand away from it and spray it down? I think most of us would agree we would rather stand away from the toilet and spray it down with a, a disinfectant or a machine like this uh, as opposed to being right next to it. So here's a video that we have, and this just is a, a visual to show you how each of the different application methods for disinfection work. So it's gonna go through trigger sprayers, it's gonna go through pump up sprayers, it's gonna go through cordless uh, electrostatic sprayers, and then a, a T360. Just to show you, uh, it's a great, uh, visual to show you what disinfection is taking place when you're spraying that product.
so again, um, just another great visual to help you understand what you're actually accomplishing when you pull that trigger or pump that pump up sprayer up. You can see that there's definitely better coverages between each of them. And it's, uh, it comes down to what's, what's right for your facility. So floor care, and this is something uh, that's gonna come up, I think, a little bit more, just as we think about keeping our facilities healthy and safe. Um, similar to hand hygiene programs, it makes sense. When you think about your floors and the amount of traffic that walk into your floors, there are a lot of germs and pathogens uh, that get brought in on the people's feet. Um, so I think that one thing that's gonna have to change too going forward is that we're gonna have to up our uh, floor care in the washing. You know, how do we wash our floors? How often do we wash our floors? And what are we using to wash our floors? A lot of people still are using string mops and string mops have been tried and true. They've been around for a long time, but we're using, uh, you know, 100 year old technology to fight the new emerging pathogens that are coming out. And, you know, we need things that are more effective and more efficient to be able to get that job done quicker and better. So, when you think about your floors, I want you to think again, like hand washing, we should wash our floors a little bit more often than we are because there are a lot of germs on them. So if you're using string mops, I would recommend looking at something else. There aren't uh, hugely expensive options that you have to go up to. You could simply make a change to microfiber mop systems, not a costly change to make, but it will increase the effectiveness and the efficiency of your team on washing the floors and mopping the floors in a quicker and cleaner manner because people that use string mops tend to not change their mop buckets out and you're going to end up moving that dirty water from corner A to corner B which is also just going to move those germs from corner A to corner B. So ultimately not as effective as we would like them to be but a cheap you know perceived cheap option. So there have also been a lot of great strides in uh, battery operated small space scrubbers over the last few years. Um, great options for that. So if you don't have long hallways or large areas that need to be mopped, but you have small office areas, small restrooms, things like that, getting into a small battery operated scrubber might be a better option for you than even mopping. If you have the ability to do that, we'd love to talk to you about it and, and show you what we can do there for you. Now there's another emerging technology that's been out now for a little while and it's a floor finish that has microban in it. If you're not familiar with microban, Microban is an antimicrobial that's imbued into plastics. It's imbued into this floor finish. So baby changing stations are my best example of that. Everybody's probably seen when most people have probably used one. Baby changing stations have microban in it. So it, when something from the baby gets onto that, onto that surface, the, the organisms can't spread and grow and you know, send out the little colony forming units to keep growing and spreading across the facility from that one area. So microban, it inhibits the growth of, of uh, bacteria and uh, my microbes until you can clean it off. So floor finish that would have that in it would help keep those germs and pathogens and microbes where they're at until you can wash them up as opposed to growing and spreading across the facility from where they've landed. Or if somebody has an accident and, and vomits in the, in the hallway, that splash effect that we get, wherever those little splash droplets land, that's where they're gonna stay. Important thing to say is that this is not a magic bullet, okay? There is no magic bullet. Well, aside from cleaning and disinfecting properly, that's the magic bullet. But this isn't gonna be the cure-all, this isn't gonna be the 100% thing, but it's a great tool to have in your arsenal. I'm not saying you need to go change your floor care program and start doing this, but washing our floors first, that's gonna be the best thing that we can do, increase that. So threat level three. And this is where I think that in everybody's minds, this is where we are right now uh, and where we've been for the last eight to 10 weeks. Everybody's freaked out. There's a highly contagious pathogen in the facility, implementation of high level disinfection and specialty equipment. A college student or a coworker has tested positive for COVID-19. How do we respond when people ask, what are you doing about it? Again, I think this is where we are right now, but I don't think we have to be because this is where we have gone out and we have bought uh, specialized tools and chemicals and uh, more hand sanitizer and more disinfectant. We've isolated the room, we've cleaned, we've deep cleaned. We've probably gone back in the day after we just did it, even though it's still clean and we probably did it again because we have to show people that we're doing what we're doing to keep them safe, right? So again, this is where you guys have become more important than ever. 
I believe that if you take what you know about cleaning and disinfecting and what maybe you're learning today and be able to go back to the people in your facilities, the administrators above you, whoever your bosses or, uh, or clients or customers may be and say, if I can clean and disinfect properly every day that you, we operate, then I believe threat level two is where we can live. The thing to remember about COVID-19 is it's not a super bug. This is why hand washing is so effective against it. It breaks down very easily under soap and water and just the, the simple actions of washing your hands. So if we take that principle again of washing our hands and we apply that to surfaces, we apply it to floors, we apply it to everything that we do, when we clean and disinfect properly, threat level three isn't really where we need to be. Threat level two is really where we should live and most likely we should live almost, that's where we really should probably operate from a cleaning perspective. Not that we're always in threat level two, but somebody always has staff, somebody always has a cold, somebody always is spreading something around. So all of our buildings every day have something in it that's being spread around. And if we don't clean and disinfect properly, it's going to happen to somebody else. So threat level four, this is highly lethal pathogens in the facility requires specialized knowledge and equipment. This is not in our job description. This is the guys in yellow suits jumping out of helicopters, bringing tents down over your buildings, and you have to walk through the decontamination chamber to get out. This is weapons grade pathogens and bioterrorism. Proper training and procedures. Consistent training on products and procedures improves cleaning quality and gives, your, uh, gives you greater efficiencies. So we start with knowing your current cleaning baseline. This is where you're at, right? You know, this is where you were at before this whole thing lifted off. This is, you, you know, did you know what products to use? How many people were cleaning your facility? What equipment do you use? What processes and training are in place? And what is the square footage you're cleaning? And what are your high touch points? That's your baseline. And while we're talking about, do you know, what equipment do you use? You know, what equipment do you own? Every one of you has a piece of equipment that you bought a year, five, 10 years ago that you bought for a reason, but it's probably sitting in the closet. That leads us into optimizing our baseline. So we know what equipment we have. Are we using all of that equipment? You know, everybody's got one. Everybody's got a piece that's sitting there that they bought thinking, boy, that's a great tool and I'm gonna use that. That's gonna help us keep this place cleaner and healthier and safer because we have it, but there it sits. Maybe somebody forgot about it. You know, there's been a, you know, some people have changed and we didn't know about it, but somebody knows about it, but nobody ever uses it. So it might be time to dust off some of that stuff and look at it, evaluate it, figure out, is it going to be a good thing for us to use going forward? Or even in evaluating your current equipment, do you have the right equipment already? Or does it need to be repaired or replaced? There are a lot of questions that you're going to have to ask yourself going out of this to be able to help uh, open your facility wisely and safely. So managing your, you know, managing your budget, there's going to be a big hurdle to overcome for a lot of people going out of this because we've ramped up and we've bought so much stuff that our budgets are pretty well shot probably by this point. And how are we going to overcome that going forward? Knowing a lot of what we're talking about now is going to help do that. When we know the dwell times, when we know the proper usage of our chemicals, we're going to be able to use them more efficiently. Therefore, it will help cut down on the overall cost in the long run. So we can go through, we're going to go through some of that in a little bit too. So proper training and procedures. Uh, that can also be accomplished through training, job cards, procedural charts. Our friends at Hilliard made up these awesome uh, flow charts for us to show how to disinfect restrooms. And we've got some for other areas. I've got those pictures coming up. But just does everybody know the proper steps to go through a room and clean it and disinfect it? These visuals will help people do that. Proactive team communication. We're trying to do that. Every time we get something, we're trying to send that out to you guys. And then vice versa, you guys, or and then vis -vis, you guys are sending it out to your people. You need to be proactive and be ahead of it and uh, let them know what you're doing, what you've learned to help them get their jobs done better. Public relations and addressing community questions. We have a lot of tools that we have access to give you access to, to help you show people what you're doing um, to keep them healthy and safe in your facilities. And that's gonna be huge going forward. And when we start opening things up, people are gonna wanna know, if I go in there, am I gonna be safe? We can help you. So 
what products do I use? Well, what is your facility's need? That's really the, the best question. There's Because there's a lot of different disinfectants with varying dwell times. Some are straight disinfectants and some are one-step disinfectant cleaners. Again, going back to knowing what we know about the difference between cleaning and disinfecting, can you use a, a disinfectant cleaner instead of just having to use a disinfectant? The answer is yes. But you have to remember that if that surface has a mucus barrier or some kind of a pop spill or coffee spill or visible debris, you have to make sure you clean that away and leave enough disinfectant behind for it to do its job. So disinfectants right now, we've seen dwell times from 30 seconds to 10 minutes. Quite a, a variety of disinfectants out there. Typically, the disinfectants with the higher or the, the shorter dwell times aren't as good cleaners. Again, that's a general statement, but you have to know. And again, back to the label, read the label. It will tell you. Um, so you have to remember, though, when you're disinfecting and cleaning, clean the area first and leave enough disinfectant behind for the dwell time needed. So again, both are viable options. We just have to know what's going to work best for you. Do you need a 30-second kill claim? Do you need a 10 minute kill claim? It all depends, you know, if, you, if you're a facility that have people, you know, approaching counters and they're touching those counters, you know, time after time after time, then you might need a 30 second to two minute contact dwell time to help keep business moving. You can't, if somebody comes up, they go away, you spray a 10 minute disinfectant, next person can't come up for 10 minutes, then you can't have that. If you have to have turnover, then you've got to have a quicker kill claim. But if you have the ability to wait, have people wait to get into places, then you won't need a, a, that quick of a kill claim. There's a cost associated with that. Quicker kill claims generally cost a little more. Um, what procedures should I follow? What outcome do you want? There are five different levels of clean that have been identified by the APPA, APA. The ISSA looks at those as well, and we use those in a lot of our cleaning standards. Level one is orderly spotlessness. If you want to achieve orderly spotlessness, basically you need to think of yourself as a hospital. Hospitals generally operate at orderly spotlessness. This is where everything is gleaming. Everything is shiny. There is no visible dirt anywhere. You can tell that the restrooms are clean. The trash isn't full. Uh, you don't have any question in your mind that this restroom or area has been disinfected. That's the hospital. Ordinary tidiness looks a lot like a hospital, but there might be a little bit of dust somewhere. Uh, there might be like a dust bunny in the corner, maybe. Uh, the trash is still today's trash. It might be a little fuller, but because somebody maybe hasn't gone in and ported and dumped it out. Um, but you still know the restrooms have been disinfected. The trash is getting changed daily. Uh, you can tell that this place is definitely very clean. Uh, casual inattention. Casual inattention, traffic paths are getting swept. There's visible dust on the sides. There's visible dust on counters and vertical surfaces um, or horizontal surfaces. There are, um, the trash is still being done daily. The touch points in the restrooms and doorknobs and handles are still being disinfected. But you can tell that there's, it's not perfect, but it's clean. I, I still feel safe. But I don't think casual inattention is going to cut it. And casual inattention, again, you know, much like threat level two or threat level one, I think this is kind of where we've lived for a long time because we've gotten comfortable. We think that because we've sprayed that lemon disinfectant in the air that people will, you know, feel safe. People are going to need to see a little bit more of what we do. They're going to ask more and more. I, I, I was just uh, working with somebody yesterday that said, I've been asked more over the last five weeks what I use to disinfect than I've ever been asked in my career as a custodian. I'm sure all of us have been asked that question a lot more lately. It's not going to stop. I think it's going to keep up for a while. And it's important for us to be able to understand what we do and communicate to the people that we work with how you're keeping them healthy and safe in your facility. Level four, moderate dinginess. This is trash is starting to smell a little bit. You definitely see dust on the, the edges. Uh, you can tell that maybe some mopping and vacuuming is being done. Maybe not. It's definitely not done every day. Um, so still, you're still okay with there and you, 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 that's the restroom. You're going to open the door up and you're going to look and you're like, yeah, I can use that. Unkempt neglect. This is the run away from me. You definitely don't use the restroom in me building. Um, 
don't, uh, nobody should be living in unkempt neglect anymore because all unkempt neglect does is propitiate the system or uh, the, the, the viruses, not just COVID-19, but every sickness that's out there will live in an unkempt neglect type facility. So back to consistent procedures. This is uh, more of those charts that I told you about that I was gonna show you that just, they're built for different areas. You've got restrooms, schools, offices. We have them for transportation vehicles uh, from buses to, off to, to personal vehicles. Guys, we have a lot of tools that can help you show the people that you work with that you're doing everything you can to keep them healthy and safe. And on the flip side of this card, dwell times, people need to know these. These aren't, you know, it's, it's like being back in school, quizzing people on what their dwell times and should be maybe a part of an opening meeting you have, or, uh, you know, if you've got meetings with your facility team to say, hey, who can tell me the dwell time of whatever disinfectant we're using? Uh, this card on the back gives you a spot to put your dwell time, 10 minutes, five minutes, two minutes, whatever it may be, you can write it on that. Verification, validation, documentation. There are different tools to validate the cleanliness and disinfection of a room. Physical inspection, uh, we have uh, tools that you can use to do physical inspections and write up uh, inspection reports to go back and talk to your, your people about. Uh, there's black light checks that you can do uh, to show what residuals are left after cleaning. Uh, there are ATP meters. This is a, kind of the, a high-end device, but it, uh, it has a swab that you can swab the surface you put it into the meter, it tells you how dirty it is, you clean the surface, you swab it again, it'll tell you how well you removed uh, bacteria, food debris, yeast and mold from that surface. Moving forward, inspections of some kind should become a regular part of your program if it isn't already. Again, things that people are gonna wanna see that you do to keep them healthy and safe. You have a lot of resources available to you for proper training as well. Um, and, and procedures. Us, your KSS sales consultants, uh, or KSS as a company in whole, we are trained, we have industry veterans, we have vendors and partners who are also industry veterans that can help assist in training. When we can, we're gonna get back to doing on-site in-service training. I know there've been some that have already been starting to do that, and uh, I think that's a good sign that we're getting closer to being back to normal, the new norm. Um, training seminars, Traditionally, we've held our summer expos, unfortunately, and our, and our lunch and learns. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we're not doing those this year, but we're going to be doing more of what we're doing right now. Um, this is uh, our fifth or sixth one of these that we've been doing, and it's going very well. So we're going to utilize this platform until we can get back to doing things like we'd like to. Um, online training. If you have our Hilliard CAT program uh, or Buckeye pro products, you have access to these online training programs. And they have videos, uh, they've got quizzes, they've got all of the things that you need to help teach and train your people. Online meetings like this, again, there are great step-by-step -step training programs that we can give you access to through these programs. Websites, kss.com or kssenterprises.com, hilliard.com, all the buckeye.com, Clorox Pro, uh, all of these websites have great resources. On KSS website, if you scroll down, there'll be a red banner that says COVID-19. Uh, or coronavirus, uh, it's red, it'll say click me, click there, it opens up a vast library. A lot of what you've seen today is there, um, but uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the links and things uh, during the Q&A. But all of these websites have great resources. They all have COVID-19 areas that you can go click on. You can see up-to-date CDC information about what's going on. Um, again, you have access to these. Our vendor partners and what they bring to the table. So Hilliard, uh, a great company that we've worked with for a long time. Uh, Hilliard, they bring us our Arsenal One dilutable con uh, dilution control systems and Affinity Hand Hygiene. That's uh, their hand soap and hand sanitizer line. Buckeye International, they have our Symmetry. That's another hand hygiene line. And Clarion 25 with the floor finish with uh, uh, microband. Clorox Pro, the Clorox T360 has been the talk of the town for the last you know, well, three years, but lately it's been really the talk of the town for the last couple of months. So uh, Purell, Dial, both also great hand hygiene programs that we have access to that give you access to them. And Tenant, great cleaning equipment to help keep your, uh, help keep your facility healthy and safe. Guys, in conclusion, 
if we do the daily tasks of cleaning properly and we follow the directions of the disinfectants, we can reduce the risk of the facility exponentially before the outbreak gets here. Successful cleaning is the marriage of procedural knowledge and disinfectant chemistry. A person using the world's best disinfectant without procedural knowledge will, fa will fail at proper disinfection. When this thing started, I remember watching the news and they were showing this lady, she was cleaning the airport. She had her disinfectant, she had her rag, she had her mask, she had her goggles. She went to the chairs in the terminal, sprayed them, wiped it down, moved to the next one, sprayed it, wiped it down. And guys, she had the right tools, but she wasn't disinfecting. Because it was, I, I, it, we could tell what disinfectant was because we're smart and we can look at the bottle. We knew what it was, I knew what it was at least. And I was like, she's not doing anything better than maybe cleaning that thing. And the poor lady now is on the news for the world to see that she wasn't trained to how to do her job. It's important guys, that we know what we're doing, that we teach our people how to do this. That's gonna be the biggest key to opening safely and wisely is that you guys being able to talk about what you do it confidently to say, I know I'm keeping this facility healthy and safe. I can tell you what product I'm using. I can tell you that it's on the list. I can tell you the dwell time and we're doing the best that we can to keep you safe. So guys, that's uh, the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, if, if you need any further information, you can reach out to your sales consultant, or if you don't know who your sales consultant is, reach out to the info at kssenterprises.com. You can reach out to me. I'm more than happy to talk to anybody. If you're working with somebody, I'll probably end up finding out who that is and getting you in touch with them. But guys, feel free. Absolutely. I'm a resource. I love to be uh, helpful. So there's our information. And thank you so much for your time. I'm glad that you took the time and felt this was important to listen to. And uh, we're going to open it up for the Q&A. So I'm going to stop my screen share. Jen's going to take the wheel. Thank you so much, Andrew. I really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and unmute Paul from Clorox and also Jeff uh, from Hilliard. So if there's any questions that we want to direct to them as well. Um, Jeff, it's not letting me unmute you, so you're going to need to unmute yourself. Um, but if you would go ahead and do okay. that. I do have a couple of questions that have come in, and please feel free as we're talking to just continue to message your questions through chat, and we'll go through them. Um, one was uh, very practical. How much does the Clorox T360 weigh? Someone is using it in a facility where there's a lot of stairs um, and are wondering just the weight of that machine. It weighs, uh, well, good morning, everybody. Great job, Andrew. Um, it weighs about 40 pounds. You put on the chemistry, you add about 16 more pounds to the system. So, yeah, so you get a good workout going up and yes. downstairs yes. with Clorox T360 all the time, for sure. Uh, one hang, of on, the hang on, Paul, it sounds yeah. like you said 60. Did you mean 1616 or 60? 16 more pounds, yeah. Yeah, a gallon weighs about eight pounds. Just wanted to clarify. It yes. sounded like you said yeah. add another 60. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We'd be really strong then. Yeah. So. One of the other questions that came in was uh, someone has a portable church loading, meaning they load in and out of a school on a Sunday morning, most interested in the safety of products for children, as well as drying time of cleaning products. If we set up and then clean everything before service, set up to have, I mean, clean to let it dry to pack it up. So um, it's kind of back to that knowing the dwell times of the products, but if someone wants to talk a little bit, probably more specifically about the cleaning of toys and things for children. Okay. So yeah, with toys, um, you, again, a lot of people usually sanitize toys because they're worried about kids putting them in their mouths and playing with them and then touching all over their faces and stuff, which, um, you know, obviously with kids, it's hard to discourage them from touching their faces and putting things in their mouths. So sanitizers, unfortunately, they don't kill uh, the viruses that are on the emerging pathogen protocols. So it's still better, better than nothing. So sanitizing them still work. But if you disinfect them, when you, you use a disinfectant, you obviously need to let it set for its dwell time so that anywhere from three to 10 minutes, depending on what disinfectant you're using, you'll want to rinse that toy and let it dry before you let the kids play with it. So it's going to come down to, do you have enough time to do all that before church? You may have to start setting up a little earlier. And then again, if the facility will let you do that, that's a question as well. But I think the key part there is when you're setting up, if you have plastic chairs, then yes, wiping them down with a disinfecting and letting them dry, disinfect and letting them dry is fine. And this is where one of you other guys might want to jump in. But if it's me thinking rationally about it, 
after church, if you're disinfecting them and putting them away in a container of some kind, whether it's a trailer and they're never used again until next Sunday, they're probably still disinfected and you don't need to wipe them off beforehand. But I don't know all your uses, so I don't know if you're using them in the interim. Anybody else have anything they want to add? I'll just mention that the uh, state of Michigan, and this is for daycares, has, have, has, has had the same protocol since 1977, and that's to use bleach to uh, disinfect and sanitize. So your church, you're not really falling under those guidelines, but um, sanitization is what they, they consider the, the way to do it just because of the, the potential of kids, small children putting toys in their mouths. So if you are going to disinfect, like Andrew mentioned, you do need to rinse them. Otherwise, you can sanitize and not have to worry about rinsing. Perfect. Um, I had someone ask about the disinfecting charts and if they are available. Um, yes, so for being on this uh, seminar with us today, I will actually be sending out a link to all of you who are participating that <clears throat> if you click on that link, there will be disinfecting charts that you can download. There'll be hand washing posters that you could download and laminate and put up in your facility as well. Um, there's the piece on hand towels versus air dryers. There's a link to the Clorox T360 video. So there's some different resources um, that will be available to you uh, there in that link that I send over. And then also too on the KSS website, if you uh, visit our website, which again is kssenterprises.com, under the main picture, there is a red banner that says, uh, look for information, learn information about COVID-19. And if you click on that, there's some other resources that we have available to you at no charge there as well. Um, so all of those places are a great way to do it. Uh, if you uh, also too, when I send that email, if there's something else that you're looking for that perhaps isn't included in that link, just let me know. We we do have so many different resources that are available <clears throat> um, as far as that. Uh, and then someone asked, are we able to get the posting? I assume that means the video here today. Um, yes, when we are uh, through, I will be uh, posting the video. And again, I'll have a link to that also in that follow-up email that I send to you. So if you perhaps had team members that were unable to attend today and you wanted to share the information with your team members, we'll have it for you that way as well. Um, and then I had someone ask, is there any other option similar to the T360 that is as effective? Well, I'll, I'll answer that to keep Paul from having to do the sales pitch. <laughs> but, so, okay. Uh, there are a lot of different tools out there, like I mentioned. So there's been an emergence of foggers, misters. Um, anybody that comes from a maintenance or construction background have seen that Graco and Titan, who make airless paint sprayers, are now selling those as uh, mass dispersion of disinfection, disinfectant. There are several different battery-operated uh, electrostatic sprayers out there. Um, guys, the important part to remember there is when you're looking at these disinfection methods is that the label is going to tell you if it's approved for that mode of dis you know, dispensing the product. So from an electrostatic standpoint, um, the video that I showed with the light bulb kind of shows you the difference between the cordless electrostatic sprayers and the T360, which is, I'll say it, true electrostatic spraying because it has, it's not cordless, it's corded. So anytime you have electricity that's cordless, it has a very, you know, varying path and it isn't going to give you consistent coverage like a corded unit will. So to this, the simple answer would be no, there isn't anything that's as effective, there are other items that may be better, that not better, but will work better than old tools like pump up sprayers and spray bottles. So it, again, it's kind of a hard answer to say 100%, but labels will tell you a lot of if it's approved for that mode. So keep that in mind. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Paul or Jeff, I don't know if you want to jump in on that or if I should continue. I can, I can just mention in regards to the label, the, the label is considered a legal document. And if it does say that you can use it for fogging, then you can put it through a fogger. Um, <clears throat> Clorox did do a lot of research in terms of matching up the T360 disinfectant, uh, the Anywhere uh, sanitizer, and a new product called Sport Defense to make sure that it was EPA approved to go through an electrostatic sprayer. So as long as your product, your disinfectant, um, says it on the label, you can use it through, again, through a fogger yep. or another electrostatic sprayer. But just, just make sure you're not violating 
the EPA rules. Perfect. Yep. Um, I also had somebody ask, uh, is there any recommendations for cleaning microphones or electronic equipment? Electronics. A <laughs> <laughs> Don't everybody go at once. Gets, <laughs> electronics gets dicey because yeah, it you does. can obviously soak them. Um, right. But uh, I think that's where you can you know, if you wipe them down well enough, I would probably, I would probably look to a, a quicker kill claim disinfectant so that you don't have to um, get them that wet. Um, right. The T360, I mean, I don't know what your facility is, but the T360 is safe on electronics. Um, we use that and we spray keyboards and uh, computers and things like that. So, but there are other disinfectant sprays that you can get that have 30 second to two minute kill claims. And if you can get that surface wet long enough for that, that's probably my best recommendation. Paul, Jeff? Uh, you covered it, Andrew. I think you covered it, Andrew. Yeah, I think Perfect. I think you did, yeah. Perfect. Yep. I did have someone ask about ultraviolet light and could that be effective? And what would be the dwell time of ultraviolet light for killing things? <laughs> Well, Clorox uh, just separated with a company that had ultraviolet uh, light uh, equipment available. Um, you would wheel it into a patient room and you would turn it on and let it sit, let it stay there for about 24 hours. It was a $20,000 piece of equipment, but you see online all the time now people waving ultraviolet lights over mm -hmm. desks and equipment. Um, I'm not sure what the exact contact time or how long you have to have that ultraviolet light sitting over you know, um, your desk to actually get the kill claim. That's something you have to drill down on. We do know that barber shops have been using ultraviolet light forever. They set their tools in those little boxes. Um, but again, I'm not sure how long you have to have it sit under ultraviolet light to get the proper kill claim. So it's kind of sketchy science right now. Um, it, it does work, but uh, in a mass application of us wandering around and waving ultraviolet lights, I think the regular disinfectant process works best. Agreed. All right, let's see if there's anything else. Agreed. Um, I had somebody say, we currently use alcohol pads on our microphones. Would that still be sufficient? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I mean, we use 60% yep. <laughs> yes. hand sanitizer. It's alcohol based to, uh, kill germs, alcohol wipes work. All right, that looks like all yeah. of the questions that I have right now, just making sure, sorry, I'm looking down, but I'm trying to scroll and just make sure I haven't missed anybody's question. You're okay, Jen, no worries. That they have, looks like that is all of them. So if anybody has anything else, oh wait, one new message, let's jump on. Uh, we have carpet in our classroom. How can we effectively clean that? So uh, carpets fall under soft surface uh, sanitizing. Uh, so unfortunately, you can't ever say that you're disinfecting them. Um, the best things that you can do is, uh, you know, Hilliard has a great product that we have now called the soft surface sanitizer. Uh, we can spray that down. Um, but through your normal protocols of uh, extraction and uh, vacuuming, uh, taking care of your carpets, um, those are going to be your best ways to keep people uh, comfortable with your carpets. So if you can show them what you're doing as far as floor care or carpet care goes, using the, the right kind of extraction chemicals, you have the soft surface sanitizers available. Um, and then the other thing, and I, I just lost my train of thought, uh, um, vacuuming. <laughs> That's where I'm going. <laughs> if you use the right vacuums on those carpets, uh, especially if it's a commercial grade carpet, uh, Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but the pro team backpacks get down to a 0.3 micron with the HEPA filtration. That is correct. Okay. So we're going to, and, and they're approved by the uh, American Heart and Lung Association for improving the indoor air quality in a facility. So again, it goes back to knowing what tools you have and showing people that you have the right tools in place that are gonna get those pathogens and microbes out of the air. So the, so the next question to follow up to that one, would that also apply to pews in the church that have 
cloth seats. Yes. <laughs> Great. How? Wait, wait. However, because I, I mean, I, I work with several churches, and I've gotten this question a lot. The one thing you want to pay attention to is, even though you have cloth on your pews, you still have a lot of hard surface around there. Yeah, hard so surfaces. Yeah. Right now, you're going to be dealing with uh, how do I have? If you have multiple services, am I having to wipe everything down between services as well? So keep that in mind. I, I, I've, an, right. I've answered that question a lot over the last couple of weeks. So Perfect. We'll give it just one second here to see if anyone else jumps in, but it looks like that is all of our questions right now. Again, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Uh, thank you to Jeff and Paul and Andrew for the information. Again, um, I will be sending out uh, the follow-up link. You'll have that no later than tomorrow morning, probably still yet today, um, with all of the information that we talked about. Um, if there is anything else, you can always email info at kssenterprises.com. If you don't know who your rep is or talk with your rep, um, they've all gone through the presentation. That They know the information that's being presented um, so that they are fully aware of all of the things that we've discussed today. And if there's anything else we can do at KSS to help, please just let us know. So thank you so much, everybody, for being here. We really appreciate thank it. You. Have a thank good you. day. Yeah, have a good day, everybody. Bye. Bye.